Welcome to Embedded. I am Alicia White. I'm on my own as a host this week because my guest is Christopher White. What? Hello, and thank you for being on the show. How did I get here? Could you tell us about yourself as though we just met over, I don't know, conference lunch table? You want me to do it as if I was actually at a conference lunch table? Because that's just going to be five minutes of silence. Or, okay, I'll, I'll act as a person who would do that. Hello, my name is Christopher White. I, I'm an embedded software engineer. My thoughts a lie. I'm a software engineer. <laughs> uh, I've been working for about uh, 25 years, something like that. Something like that. Uh, on a variety of things at a variety of companies. Um, some of them very small little devices and some of them bigger, more expensive devices and some of them scary devices and some of them boring devices. Okay, so we're going to talk about your career going through small and scary and big and boring. Yeah, so this is your opportunity to turn it off now. And But before we do that, I want to prove that it is you. <laughs> okay. You're looking at me, so I'm a little worried. Yes or no? Do you... No. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll cut that. Do you know the month and date of when we started dating? August 26th, 1994. How do you know that date? Because I took a little, uh, I took the, the far side calendar day off my far side calendar and kept it. How did you tell your brother that we got a dog? I butt dialed him on the way home uh, from picking up the dog and the dog was just howling in the car. After we attended a book completion party, as we left the pizza place, do you remember what you said? Uh, it was some variant of, wow, we're really cool, but... I don't think it makes... was we. <laughs> I think there was a pronoun there. Was there? Yeah. I'm pretty cool? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, there's a whole story that goes with that that, that, that makes that sound less <laughs> ridiculous than it sounds. <laughs> what skateboarding injury caused the most amount of blood loss? Blood loss? Well, I've only had really one skateboarding injury. That was when, so there are these trees. I don't know if you know about these trees, but they drop little things that look like uh, the bombs in all the Mario games with little spikes coming out of them. And they're, they're hard. Like sea urchins. Yeah, but with less, they're less long and, but they're, they're just pokey seeds. And our college, the, the, there are a bunch of these trees that drop them. And they were great for getting stuck under uh, skateboard wheels as you were going. And, and so what happened in this particular incident was, I was going and the skateboard wheel hit one of those and the skateboard stopped. But as you might know from physics, um, that doesn't mean that, that you stop. And so I kept going until I landed on my elbow. It was great. Uh, but as I was flying through the air, I was reassuring my, my roommate who was skateboarding alongside me that I was fine. Were you? At the time when I was flying through the air, I was, but I admit that I was premature in that assessment doing so before I hit the ground. What's your favorite instrument? Favorite instrument. It's okay. You can look around. There are hints around here. <laughs> uh, uh, the one I've, the one I'm playing at the time. Uh, what is your least favorite Star Wars character? Least favorite Star Wars character. See, the the obvious go to, of course, is is, is the one we're all thinking of. But. Jar -jar. Uh, um, I really don't like one of the Emperor's purple pie men guys. The, those guys, they were weird and they're kind of creepy. I didn't care for them. Return of the Jedi. Uh, favorite number between 273 and 477 inclusive? 301. Do you have a tip everyone should know? Uh, mm, always check your references. No, I stole that from a movie. Uh, don't, <laughs> don't always panic. How did you get the moniker Stony Monster? You really want me to go into this story? Well, I'm going to ask you about going to school next, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It's really boring. Okay. 
am I going to reveal this to, to all 10 of our listeners? Okay. So in college, uh, we had this like pre period before classes start, I think like a week or so everyone was settling in, whatever. And, uh, they had these activities and things for people to get relax, to know each, get other. To know each other. They were, there were some nice things and then they had some things where they mixed it up and, and, you know, made me question ever going to college ever. But anyway, uh, one of these trips, little side trips, was to a, uh, a lake near near school. It was probably a reservoir, but uh, Lake Puddingstone is what it was called. And so a bunch of people went, neither here nor there, nothing happened there. Uh, but at breakfast, I think the next morning, uh, I was making a joke, and I said, Hi, I'm Stoney the Puddingstone Monster. And and from then on, I was Stoney the Puddingstone Monster, and I just personally shortened it to Stony Monster and turned out that nobody on the internet had that at the time. Well, there weren't that many people on the internet at that time. Amongst the 50 of us on the internet at that time. There, there was already there a Chris was, White. There was already several <laughs> Chris Whites. Uh, but there wasn't a Sony Monster, so I used that for emails and stuff. And I started using it for user IDs and things, and I kept using it. Even though it sounds vaguely druggy, that wasn't the <laughs> connection. <laughs> so the school you're talking about is Harvey Mudd College. Uh Yes. Why did you go there? Uh, it was a, hmm. I was a very lazy student in high school, even though I did well, um, which set me up for really great things in the future in school. <laughs> that was sarcasm. When being lazy wasn't great. Um, and applying to colleges was hard. So I, I, uh, my, my, uh, guidance counselor in high school was really hot on Harvey Mudd College. And he encouraged a couple of us to look at it seriously. And around the same time, I got their ridiculous ad in the mail, because back then, I don't know if it's still true, they, the schools inundate people with ads. <laughs> so you'll apply. Uh, and it was their junk mail ad. I don't remember what it exactly was. I sent was, a postcard was, yeah. that said junk mail junk on mail, it, which yeah. was quite a bit different than... It was very tongue-in-cheek and self-deprecating, and it, it appealed to me as a sar sarcastic 17 or 18-year-old at the time. Um, so, yeah, I did some more research into them, and I, I think I, I applied to them early decision, but I, I went and visited, and it seemed like the sort of place that kind of connected with me. It was small. My, my high school is very small. This was bigger, but still small <laughs> compared to most colleges, I think. I think our whole entering class was 150 or 120 people, something like that. So it didn't seem scary to me to go from high school to that, you know, versus going to say Berkeley or something or another public university with 20 or 30,000 students. Um, so that was nice. And it felt like going there and seeing and talking to the professors and stuff and seeing the little fakey classes they let you attend and, and things. They, they were small, um, so it felt like we weren't going to be lost in the sea of students. So that was probably the biggest factor. Uh, and the other thing was I was interested in science and they, that was all they do pretty much. And it seemed like, okay, I should go someplace that focuses on this. Interested in science, but you majored in math. Well, yeah, but that was a later decision. And now you write software. That's a rumor. Was, was a math degree from Harvey Mudd good pr preparation for you, for your career? Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, for a variety of reasons, one, I didn't just take math. <laughs> uh, let's go back. I started out, um, thinking I was going to be quote an engineer. Harvey Mudd is an engineering school. That's how they used to advertise themselves. I don't think they do anymore, but the focus was definitely engineering. Engineering was the largest department with the biggest funding and everything. And so, you know, my brother was an, a mechanical engineer in college and engineering seemed cool. You got to build things. So, and learn about, you know, various cool applied areas of science. So that was what I was going to do until I took my first engineering course, which I think was first semester. It was called E4 and it wasn't even really an engineering course. It was a, a projects course to kind of get you to learn how a little bit, how companies might work and how working on a project on a team might work and how to give presentations to companies. And so, you know, you get on a small team of four or five people and you have a project for the whole semester where you have to design something and it's not even something real. 
at least it doesn't have to be. Some of them were more real than others. Uh, I think mine was some sort of modular connector system for plugging. I don't even know what it was for, but it was just a connector idea. It wasn't, we weren't building anything that did anything. And it was a nightmare. God, working with people is terrible. You know, I I, I, I guess I came in there assuming everybody was going to be super excited and motivated. And it turns out even, you know, they weren't. And a couple people never did much. And there was a lot of arguing. And I just, at that stage of my development, finding out even little bits about how <laughs> managing things works was a huge turnoff. And I think I just went, engineering, I don't want to work at a company. This is stupid. <laughs> um, and so I started looking at other things to do. And, and math was cool and seemed like I could do a lot with it. And I didn't have to necessarily decide on my career instantaneously. But you also worked for the computer science department. Yeah, well, I took a lot of CS courses. So my math degree, they used to have before MUD had a, a CS department, which was relatively new when we showed up there, they had a math slash CS degree in the math department, which meant you took a bunch of math classes and then a prearranged set of CS courses. And I sort of did that. Not quite. <laughs> I did a pure math degree and then took basically all my electives in the CS department. Anytime I had free free time I, or free space in the semester, I would take a, a CS course. So I, I took a lot of CS courses. So that got me on to working for the CS department. What were your least favorite classes? Ooh, um, physics of all kinds. Because um, I did very poorly in them. And I, the, the ones I did poorly in, it's kind of a cop-out, but I, I don't feel like they were taught that well. Although it was definitely on me. <laughs> that I failed them because I kind of gave up and didn't engage and didn't do the homework. And going back to the whole lazy high school student thing, I hadn't quite figured out how studying worked. And it turned out that even though I thought I was doing cool stuff in high school and learning things, took a bunch of AP classes, did really well, uh, college courses were uh, slightly more challenging. And uh, that that bit me. So physics, I uh, did very poorly in physics. And um, a physics-like course in the engineering department called uh, stems systems engineering systems engineering and it was basically the same kind of stuff from physics you know from freshman physics it was uh basic electronics and stuff and uh what was the other like a uh, uh, mechanical systems so spring systems and all that that stuff that you get in you know your first and second semester of freshman physics. So they taught that in the engineering department again, for some reason. Maybe they just didn't trust the physicists. I mean, it was about differential equations. The goal was... Yeah, so was physics. X and X dot and yep. X dot dot. Yeah, yeah. That was, it's all the same stuff. Yeah, but and it was since, totally And since I failed it the first time, <laughs> going in and being presented that with the engineering department's attitude, which I might remind you, I was not hot on very quick, very early on. Uh, I didn't do so great in that one. But I, I got a D in that class, so I didn't have to take that one again. Music. You played music then? <laughs> yes, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you had an electric bass. Yeah, that one. Yes, he pointed out. F for the audience, there's a black electric bass hanging on a column. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. It totally makes sense. Uh, it, what did you play? Um, I played a lot of... I, I, I played bass. My brother and I had been kind of playing music together a little bit back then toward the end of high school and when I started college. Um, so that's when I started learning bass. Uh, so we had a few songs we were working on even back then. And I played along to a lot of Rush records and stuff. <laughs> that was pretty much what I did in college. Uh, I didn't have any a formal band or anything I was doing back then. And when you say you played together with your brother, yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that happen? Did you physically in the same room? Oh, did you yeah. record? Yeah. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. There was no way to do it. <laughs> I suppose we could have shipped tapes back and forth. Uh, I don't know if we ever tried that, but no, that back then, and we didn't do much during college. He was, he was busy in grad school. I was busy in undergrad. Um, so yeah. Okay, and so skipping ahead a few years... Wait, we're done with college? No, no, no. Oh, okay. How did you get your summer internship junior year? Junior year. 
Right. Summer internship. Um, Starts with a C. No, I know where I went. You asked me how, not where. (laughs) (laughs) I'm paying attention to the questions. Um, Yes, it was at Cisco Systems. And it was kind of, kind of a last minute thing because uh, everyone was trying to get an internship junior year. This was the thing to do. And basically everybody who got them either went up to the Bay Area or went to San Diego. And there was very, very few other places, other places where companies were, uh, that were hiring. Um, and so I had looked around and looked in the Bay Area, applied to a bunch of places and didn't get anything. Um, I think we had some interviews, right? So there were some interviews. There were on-campus on-campus interviews. On-campus interviews. So I interviewed with Microsoft. And that really didn't go well. Um, it's because you didn't play solitaire enough. I didn't. I just didn't understand cards, which apparently was the whole point of the interview. Uh, the answer is always seven, even if the math works out to 6.5. <laughs> I don't, don't remember that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I interviewed there. I interviewed some other places. Didn't didn't get anything I got rejection email, rejection physical mail in my mailbox from places I hadn't applied to, which was really nice. Um, but then I ended up getting something. It was uh, with uh, an alumnus who was working on, I think, like a wedding planning website or something um, in the Bay Area. And he had some funds to do, to have a, a, somebody come in and help uh, during the summer. And I was like, all right, uh, that's that's work. I'll do it. Um, it wasn't very much money. It was barely enough to probably survive and may, may not have been <laughs> in retrospect. Um, and, uh, so I kind of was signed up for that. I was like, I don't really want to make web pages, but whatever, you know, it was back then web pages were, if you don't remember, or if this was before Weren't you alive were alive, yet. uh, this was 1994. So it was, you know, type in HTML and that was it. And if you wanted anything to happen on a server, it was something called, um, Oh crap, what was it called? Anyway, you called C code. Like it wasn't, there was no JavaScript. There was none of this stuff. Um, uh, I can't remember what they were called. Some sort of scripts that your, your web page could call out to, but it was highly insecure and a lot of typey typey, not, not a lot of visual design. Um, so I wasn't super excited about that. And then I, I just went to the career center and started looking around again toward the very end of the time when I could have found something. And there was an email in one of the binders in the career center, um, saying, Hey, uh, my team at Cisco is looking for a summer intern, blah, 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 blah. Have them send me their resume. And I said, well, well I'll try it. Um, cause I'd been doing some networking stuff in class. I enjoyed networking. Um, the concepts were cool. I think we had our clinic project, which we can talk about later was, was networking based to some degree. So I had done some things. Um, so I, threw my resume uh, out in an email and they, they responded and said, why don't you come up for an interview? And I was like, what? <laughs> that never happens. So flew up there for a day and did an interview and did well enough that they, they had me uh, do the internship that, that summer. How big was Cisco then? Uh, thousands. A um, couple thousand? Yeah, probably something like my I think my employee ID was like 4,500 or something like that. So Assuming some people had left, they were probably in the three or four thousand. And you went there. You stayed. I was going to say you went there after college, but the truth is, you worked senior year for that. Yeah, I. I don't know if I'd finished what I was doing, or I kind of had finished it, but there was more bug fixes, and I was working on some other things, and they just let me stay on uh, at at it as an intern remotely, but still at a much higher rate than the college paid us to do. Well, the college paid us minimum wage which in 1994 was like five or six bucks an hour. Um, you buy a lot of ramen for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was great. I got to work remotely, um, which, you know, it didn't seem like a big deal back then because it just seemed like, oh, okay, I work at a networking company. Of course I can work remotely. Um, so I would SSH into computers up in the Bay Area from Los Angeles and uh, had a little... Um, you know, we had a two-factor authentication thing. Even back then, we had, I had a little calculator doodad that gave me the the one-time numbers uh, to log in. Uh, I thought that was super cool, like I was in the CIA or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was really nice. And I didn't have to work a ton during class. It was just you know, fix a bug here and there, keep up 
on the bug reports coming in on the stuff I'd worked on. And then you went back to Cisco yeah. for full time mm-hmm. after school. Yeah. Did you like working there? I did uh, for quite a while. Uh, I was... It was a good place to learn because things were established and it wasn't like the startup environment being thrown into the fire immediately. Um, they had written their own operating system. So learning some operating system concepts from something you could read the source to was interesting. Uh, had some good mentors there, some very good mentors, people I've continued to to keep in touch with and work with for the <laughs> 25 years since. Um, and got, and, you know, gotten other jobs or worked together on, on contracting things. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't a sweatshop the, the tech, you know, normal, normal tech companies then weren't driving people to <laughs> work 80 hour weeks and stuff. So it just wasn't, it just felt like a normal job and I learned stuff and then, you know. And even when you lived in the Bay area, you still worked from home sometimes. A ton. Yeah, they put an ISDN line in our apartment, and uh, I had a, an actual X terminal as my second computer that just did X windows to, to inside the Cisco network, so I could get to my computer on my desk at work, which back then was a Sun workstation, <laughs> um, and, and to do whatever, and it was great. And of course, back then, windowing systems were so simple that 128 kilobits per second was just fine for you know, basically not quite VNC, but VNC like behavior. And you worked on multicast? Multicast routing. Yeah. What is that? So normally on the internet, you you have an IP address for your device and there's an IP address for a thing you're talking to, whether that's Yahoo's data center computer or um, a computer in your house that you're in your server or something. Uh, And so when you send packets back and forth, you, uh, tag them with the IP address of the thing you're talking to and yourself. This is me and I want to talk to B <laughs> or whatever. And so that's the, the things in between the switches and the routers look at those addresses and they have tables that tell them how to get to where that address lives. And there might be multiple hops, hops. in between multiple different kinds of interfaces and wires and satellites, optical fibers, whatever. And those devices know how to figure out how to take that bit of data, that packet of data, and get it to the thing it needs to go to. Um, But that's one thing to one thing. And back then, video was kind of just being thought about over the internet. There were some things you could do. Uh, Real Player was just coming out. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but it was one of the first kind of internet video things. It wasn't like YouTube. It was more like... Uh, RTSP real time streaming, which uh, some of us are still using t- <laughs> to our great horror. Um, the problem is with that kind of one to one thing is if you want to let's say you wanted to run a television company or a, or a a cable company over the internet. Well, let's say you have a million people that you want to send a TV show to. If your server has to send a separate copy to each of your million customers, it really doesn't work very well. And that's what would have to happen with unicast delivery. Unicast being the one person to one person. Multicast was built into the concept of IP, uh, the IP standard, but it hadn't really been uh, explored that much. Uh, And multicast lets you have an address that corresponds to a group of people. And then the routers in between only spread that out at the last moment they need to. So it might take one packet to go 90% of the way to the the group that needs to get that packet. But then the last router says, oh, I'm at the neighborhood now, and I need to split this packet and send it to this house, this house, this house, and this house. So it compresses all of that replication down to very, very little, depending on how things are structured. Um, and it was a big efficiency advantage. And so what I worked on was those tables, getting those devices that know how to route things from one place to another, how they communicate to each other and how they develop a map of the network so that they can figure out how to take that packet from one person and send it to the groups who are interested in it. Is multicast in use now? Yeah. 
For uh, what? Not for Netflix, because that's got to be point to point. If I press no, pause, that's, that's it doesn't... Point, that's point to point. It turns out that, you know, people built a lot of network infrastructure. But there's, um, it's used for like cable TV, for actual cable TV. Uh, all that stuff uses it. Um, for live casting of like SpaceX launches? Mm, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, it depends. Maybe, yeah, I don't think so. YouTube doesn't do that. Um, uh, but it's used inside places more than over the internet. To, like, the original vision was over the internet, but it turned. I think it's used more inside places now than, than outside. Uh, what instruments did you get while you were there? At Cisco. Um, at Cisco. I got that bass in the corner which is the upright bass which you got me full big size bass yeah and uh, the acoustic big of course yeah acoustic acoustic that's the symphony like thing yeah uh and i got the green bass over there the six string fretless I, I believe that's all i got what kind of music did you play then at cisco i don't remember was that when we were hanging out and doing bluegrass stuff I, I, we definitely were hanging out with bluegrass people. Yeah, so I might have been pretending to play some bluegrass. Oh, I, I, I was in a little blues band. A little, yeah, 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 that's right. Um, forgot all about that. We played a couple of couple of things in Mountain View. There's a, there's a, there's a Betamax or VHS or whatever was alive back then videotape of that performance. <laughs> Why did you leave Cisco? Uh, well, I've been there four years, three years, four years, um, and four years, <laughs> as all things do, things change. And uh, I had gotten to the point where I was not working on kind of big self-contained features anymore. I was chipping away at smaller features and tons of bug fixes. Uh, some of the people I worked with had left. Uh, and it had gotten quite boring. And at that point, I also, they, they were starting some new big projects and I got shunted over to a new team of people I knew, but a, a different team doing uh, basically a rewrite of the operating system, um, which I don't, I think they eventually released, but it took a very long time. <laughs> uh, the typical, very large company, oh, we want to rewrite the operating system that three people wrote in 1988. Let's put 600 people on it. Uh, so I wasn't having fun with that. I wasn't having fun fixing bugs before that. A bunch of people I knew had left, and I got a call from one of them, and he was at a new startup, and basically asked if I was interested in coming over and talking to them. And I was like, well, uh, sure, why not? <laughs> Everyone I know is already there. I might as well go. Well, and your mentors were there. Yeah. What was Procket like? Yeah, the company was called Procket. Um they were making what's called a core router, which is one of the biggest, most powerful uh, routers that drive the internet. They're where things at the middle of the network, so where all the traffic ends up going before it has to split out and go somewhere else um, to kind of aggregate all the big, big wires and optical cables and things. Um, so Procket was working on a core router with custom silicon. Um, full custom chips, which had never done, been done before for networking. Full custom meaning like a microprocessor process, like from scratch. So that was interesting. Um, no software had been done. It was just all from scratch. Very small when I joined, a couple dozen people, something like that. Maybe I think I was... Maybe less. I think I was employee 19, um, which for a young person was cool and strange and maybe not appropriate. <laughs> Um, yeah. And when I got there, there was nothing. I mean, very little. The chip people were off in the corner doing their chip stuff, but we needed a software stack to run the router, which meant all the routing protocols had to be implemented, IP routing stack. We needed an operating system. We needed an architecture. None of that existed. And it was a night and day shift from sitting and fixing little three line bugs at Cisco, you know, once a week, if I could manage <laughs> to get it through the... <laughs> the process to, uh, Hey, we need all this stuff. And, oh yeah, you were doing routing stuff, but now you're doing operating system design and, uh, this and that and, <laughs> and get on it. You became responsible for many things while you were there. Yeah. And it was sort of sudden cause you went from 
being a junior engineer to not having very many people tell you what to do. Yeah, and having to decide what to do. Um, it wasn't that I was a manager or anything, or even a tech lead. It was just there weren't very many people. Procket acted like a startup. There was <laughs> oh, it acted like. <laughs> well, I mean, Procket was a startup, but they acted like it too. There was free food, movie nights, exhortation to work weekends and long hours, video games, ping pong, expensive offices. I had my own office, which was about the, the size of your office in the house with a door and a glass windows outside and inside two desks yeah do you well the the offices aside because <laughs> um the other parts do you think it's effective to getting people to work more ah uh, it's not effective for me it's probably effective for some people um I didn't find it particularly useful. I found it kind of annoying that uh, some people decided to start coming in at lunchtime and then stay through dinner so they could just get free dinner. And then it looked like those people were working late. Um, but I usually got there early in the morning and left, tried to leave at a reasonable time. So that was always a source of annoyance and friction. Um, no, I don't, I don't really like, didn't really like, like those things that much. But you liked working at Procket. Some. For a while. What was the most important thing you worked on there, or the most important thing you learned there? Oh, God, that's a hard question. It was the first place I had to think about software from a clean design point of view. At Cisco, at Cisco, the code I had as examples to work from, in retrospect, wasn't very well written, or it had been written many, 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 many times, kind of rewritten and overwritten. And um, so it may have started out well-designed, but had accreted lots of fixes and things. Um, and so the code I was writing there wasn't very good because I was taking that as an example. And I was new too. I mean, it's not the example's necessar fault necessarily. I, you know, I tended to do things like very long, if then else chains, taking many pages, to, you know, to do logic instead of the state machine or something like that. Um, and part of the fault of that is I, I didn't take probably the CS courses that would have taught me better software design. Um, I took the ones that seemed fun to me. I know you're shaking your head. So they didn't exist. Maybe they didn't exist, but, uh, so yeah, I had to, I had to learn that real quick because I didn't want to make a mistake. <laughs> so, you know, I had Knuth books for stuff. I, I read a lot of books, read a lot of algorithms books and, and tried to figure stuff out. And, uh, so that was the biggest, most important thing I learned was, okay, this is a clean sheet project from scratch. What, what would it look like if you could do what you thought was appropriate and being able to think about a project that way, being able to do a design from beginning without writing any code, writing a very long document about how I'm going to design this thing have it reviewed by other people before writing any code. That was really important and huge. Um, yeah. And you, uh, you did something to Juniper routers from Procket. Well, how, okay. how did that work? <laughs> well, the main thing I was working on after getting the OS stuff together, and I, did, I wasn't the only person doing the OS stuff, but uh, I did like the memory management and, um, designed how we were doing message passing and, and things like that between processes. Um, because we were trying to do kind of a new thing. Most routers back then, it was the operating system was cooperative multitasking, single address space. If your routing protocol crashed, your whole router crashed. If, you know, so, which, you know, it was a problem. Um, and Juniper had actually done that too. They, they had a real operating system. Um, and they were a relatively new company too. Yeah. They, they were the first post Cisco routing startup to take a bunch of Cisco people and start and Procket was a, a follow on to that. Um, so after doing the OS stuff, I was tasked with writing what was called OSPF, which is a routing protocol. Uh, like IP is a routing protocol. No, IP is, is, is a packet protocol. IP is just the, the, the definition of how the, the packets get get put together the headers and things and addresses and checksums but if you it doesn't do anything if you just 
throw that out there on a wire. Um, <clears throat> Would I have heard of any other routing protocols? Well, have you heard of BGP? Have you heard of ISIS? Have you heard of uh, DVMRP? No, that's a multicast that's protocol. That's a lot of acronyms. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's a few of them for but different this, purposes. Um, this is how the bytes go places, how it decides where to send the packets. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, so remember how I said there's this, each of these routers have tables and things. These protocols are how the tables get generated. So if you have a network of devices, routers, and switches, but let's just talk routers, because uh, there was a distinction. Um, it was. <laughs> <laughs> the routers talk to each other to find out how to get to the things they know about. So you might have a router that connects directly to your house. And so it knows, oh, I have Elysia's house and I have her neighbor's house. And so I, I, those are directly connected to me. So I know about those networks. And so it might talk to the next router upstream and say, hey, I know about these this group of houses. And so if you want to talk to this group of houses, you need to go to me. And by the way, the wire between us costs X amount of time or something. There's a metric associated with the wires uh, to, to say which links may be better. Maybe they're faster or something like that. Um, so you say, okay, I'm router A, I connect to this neighborhood, and hey, router B, I got a neighborhood and I can get to them with cost, blah. Um, here, stick that in your table. And so you, you aggregate all of these things and it's, it's very complicated and there's actually a lot of algorithms associated with it. Um, but at the end, all these devices have tables which map out the entirety of the internet or pieces of the internet. Most of them don't have a picture of the whole internet. They have a picture of where they need to get to and then kind of aggregated things that say, well, if I need to get anywhere else, I just throw it over there. He'll know how to figure it out. Um, so OSPF was one of these routing protocols. There's kind of two classes of routing protocols, interior and exterior. Um, the exterior ones are kind of how big things, big organizations get to each other, like how one ISP gets to another ISP. And the interior is how do I get to things within my own ISP or my own company? So OSPF is an interior one. Uh, and they tend to have kind of more complicated uh, algorithms because things might change faster inside an organization. And if something changes, you don't want routing to be pointing in the wrong direction for very long. Um, so the algorithms for how to take a change way over in one side of the company and propagate that through all the routers within the company quickly, uh, figure out which paths things should take due to that change. Uh, those are the kinds of fun parts of routing uh, that, I, that I got to do with, with OSPF. Okay. Uh, answer your question, whichever, whatever it was. <laughs> I don't even remember what the question was at this point. Um Okay, no, I asked you about crashing Juniper routers. Yeah, so, right. So I wrote OSPF, uh, and as part of doing this, an organization might have lots of routers, and they might have lots of routers from different companies because it's good to have diversity within your uh, hardware and everywhere else. But um, So one of the things that we would do is interoperability testing, and I think at some point they had some of our devices and... <laughs> Oh, no, maybe some of ours were on the network, but I don't remember the circumstance exactly. But yeah, it turned out that uh, I had made a mistake somewhere and was send, send, sending a slightly malformed OSPF packet uh, to the neighbor routers. And one of the neighbor routers was Juniper's and it crashed them every time. And I thought that was great. <laughs> it's like, well, fix your bug. <laughs> Shouldn't be crashing. <laughs> you, should, you should sanitize your inputs. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> Is OSPF still used today? Yeah. All over? Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, all those routing protocols are still the same ones. BGP is still the thing that runs the, the, the backbone of the internet, and it was invented in 90-something. Music while you were at Procket. Yeah. Do you remember anything about that? Very little. Let's see. Procket, I was there like 99 to 2002. Mm. I might have gotten kind of a Frankenstein drum kit then. I think I, I think that was around the time I got a Frankenstein drum kit, somewhere around there. Um, but I wasn't doing too much. I think. Well, I think I tried to play in the HP Blues Band. Wasn't that? Yeah, the HP Blues Band. 
uh, when we had a couple of gigs and I played bass in that. Uh, and then I think I did an open mic night, uh, at, uh, JJ's blues club in, in San Jose, which did not, it was my first time playing live in a small club. I've, I played live before, but turns out you can really play badly when you can't hear yourself at all. So that was a demoralizing experience. Yeah. I was at Prockett cause I remember getting the call from the guy in the HP blues band who was forming another band that I think my open mic night thing was kind of an audition for him. I remember him calling me in my office at Prockett saying, nah, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> Went well, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you leave Prockett and why? Uh, okay, so I burned out completely. Turns out three years at a high... Prockett was not one of the 40-hour-a-week companies. <laughs> uh, it was extremely high intensity. It was one of the darlings of the dot-com era. I went through a tremendous amount of funding, was valued at billions of dollars at one point. Um, very high pressure. Things were not going well for a long time. Uh, turns out it's very hard to make six full custom chips. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Who could have guessed? Um, but it, you know, it did come together in the end and they had a product and it worked, but unfortunately the dot com boom busted right around that time. Uh, and I was just tired, uh, real tired. And, but uh, you left before the bus. Sick of software. You left quite now, a Dot com bust was around 2001, oh. 2000, 2001, I think. And I left in 2002. So stocks had already gone to nothing. Uh, Yeah, so I completely burned out, decided I hated software and engineering, uh, just like I did freshman year. And I was going to go back to school because I'd been doing some astronomy. Astronomy was cool. Astrophysics seemed cool. I'd been reading about stuff and seemed like I wanted to learn something again. So, uh, yeah, I... So your manager pulled you into your into his office to give you more stock options yeah, and more stock and bonus. Stuff. And I decided I couldn't in good conscience take that with a smile and then quit a week later. So I just said, yeah, you know what? Uh, uh, thank you for all of this, but I'm out of here. <laughs> I didn't say I'm out of here, but. <laughs> but you meant it. I tried to be polite. Okay. So you went back to school. I went back to school. You ended up with a master's degree. Master's degree in physics. 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 Okay, wait a minute. A few minutes ago, we talked about physics. It was a long time ago, like 30 minutes ago, but yeah. And you didn't like physics. Did not like physics. And then you decided to get a degree in physics. So here's the thing. I'm a very strange person. Uh, And even six years later, I still was mad about failing physics in undergrad. And like I said, I was interested in astrophysics. Um, And you can't get an astrophysics degree without the physics part. Sadly. Um, It's just astrology then. You know, I decided... Astronomy. Well, that's pretty funny, because when I left, the CEO of Prockett said, well, so why are you leaving to study astrology? And I was like, um, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just gonna go. Uh, but yeah, so I was mad about failing physics, mad, you know, internally mad, not at, not at physics. <laughs> I was mad at myself. Um, and I kind of wanted to... to <laughs> It sounds strange, but I kind of wanted to clean that clean that part of me up and prove to myself I could could learn it. And so I, yeah, I talked to San Jose State. I thought, okay, I can go there, do a master's degree, and then do a PhD somewhere else um, if I feel like it. And talked to the department head there, and he said, yeah, come in, take some summer classes because this was around summer two thousand two, um, and take some undergrad courses. And if you like it, then you, we can talk about, you know, officially getting you in the master's degree program. So I took courses in the, like the open, whatever you call it, open course system they have where anybody can take courses, took a few there and then, and then signed up for the master's degree. After that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I did, uh, e I think over the summer, undergraduate e and which is the class I had failed in my undergrad, <laughs> uh, experience. Uh, and then got in a C minus the second time. Um, and I did really well because it turns out when you're not mad at yourself and you, you actually study, <laughs> uh, you can do well. So I kept kept at it and, and enrolled the following fall and took a lot of, they, they had me do the entire undergraduate physics program before I could take graduate courses. So it took me a while. Um, I didn't have to, it wasn't as if I was a college student, undergraduate college student, but so I didn't have to take like 
electives outside that. So it was a little faster, but it was a lot of work. But you only uh, were in class for like a year, a year and a half before you went back to work? Two. Two. Two years. And you went back to work and you took classes still. Yeah. So I hadn't finished after two years because it took, it took at least a year, year and a half to get through the undergrad garbage stuff. Undergrad Things. courses, the cool courses. undergrad courses. Um, and I'd been doing research. I'd started my master's research sometime around there toward the end of that period. And it wasn't going well. And I was starting to sour a little bit on the idea of the PhD. Uh, and I think there was a summer where I was supposed to be doing research and I was just struggling really hard. My advisor had left the country, so I was working remotely with him. And it was just real hard to sit at the house all day alone <laughs> and try to do physics. <laughs> uh, and so I kind of, kind of didn't do great with that and decided, Hey, I should, uh, at the same time, somebody I had worked with at Prockett said, Hey, I'm at this new company. We need some help with something. Would you come in and contract? And so that was that summer. And I said, sure, I'll come in for a little bit, do some software. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll help uh, with my mental state. <laughs> and it did. And I enjoyed it. I had fun and I was writing software again. I was like, well, I can do both. I can finish this master's degree uh, and, and work and maybe that will keep me busy. <laughs> what company was it? A company called Reliant Technologies. And you knew people there? Just one person. Um, the person who kind of brought me in, yeah. Okay. And how did you know? I worked with him at Procket. Um, he had also been at Cisco before, but I didn't think I don't think I crossed paths with him at that time. And what did uh, Reliant make? Reliant made a laser system designed to uh, <laughs> it was a dermatological laser. It was a medical device, and you scanned it on people's skin. And it did a variety of things. Uh, it shot, well, it, it shot lasers into your skin. One laser. One laser split up by a bunch of optics. <laughs> and uh, the laser made little dots in your skin. Uh, not burns exactly, but just heating, heated spots. And it turns out that did something to erase wrinkles, scars, birthmarks, all kinds of cosmetic issues, some of which, you know, people uh, would, would help people who were really bothered by them, some of which were kind of rich person, age-related stuff that probably wasn't that important to be spending a lot of <laughs> a lot of effort on. But, but it's where but the money of, comes in from. Some of it was generally helpful, so it wasn't like I felt like we were doing something completely just targeted at the, at the super rich. Um, but the coolest part about it was the technology was cool uh there was a lot of it was my first real embedded thing you know where i had software that controlled motors and lasers and power supplies and had to do safety stuff and i had to deal with the fda and um oh and i i, I was a manager it was yeah. <laughs> they hired me as a manager so i was running the software there entirely uh so that was a huge challenge coming out of well, basically two years of grad school and being in a startup before that. So I had to learn on my feet there as well. Um, yeah, and that was my first encounter with things like RTOSs, uh, SPY, I squared C, all that good stuff I learned on my feet there. And there was a lot of really weird stuff at that company too. So I learned a lot about weird companies, uh, weird choices in technology, uh, and, you know, how to put your foot down. <laughs> Because it was a medical company. Yeah. And it was possible to hurt people. How did you learn that? How did I learn which? How did you learn how to be a manager and how to say no? Saying no was a little easier when the FDA existed outside, knocking on your door. Because you could always point to an outside agency and say, we're not going to do this because it violates this regulation or um, it doesn't live up to what we've said in the specification or uh, stuff like that. Um, or it's, you know, this is likely to be a safety issue. When you have that to fall back on, it's a little easier than when you're making a toy or something. And it's like, well, we're not going to do this because 
it's not a good idea. Okay. <laughs> that's a, when you don't have a legal argument to back it up, sometimes it's not as, not as easy to convey why you might put your foot down about some technical decision. Um, learning management, I don't know that I did very well. It was a small team. I just kind of did what I'd seen other people do. Um, tried to protect my team from things they needed protection from and tried to inform the rest of my company and about what my team did and make sure that we got, you know, a place at the table. Um, but I didn't, I probably didn't do a lot of the things one should do. Your the people you were managing were relatively senior? Much more senior than I was, yeah. What kind of music did you play at Reliant? At Reliant, I uh, started in a real band with my brother and some other folks. It was called the Ballistic Cats. I uh, started that around 2006, sort of half-heartedly, and then it sort of snowballed from there for another, ooh, five, six years. What kind of music is Ballistic Cats? Uh, sort of hard to describe rock and roll, but sort of uh, with an older vibe to it. So a lot of surf, a uh, little blues rock, um, Americana kind of stuff. So we played rockabilly, too. rock some rockabilly stuff. Yeah, that kind of flavor, but all mixed up. A lot of original stuff. We had, uh, I think we did three or four records or three records in an EP. I wasn't on one of them, but um, yeah, it was it was it was intense for a while. And what instrument? Uh, I played drums in that band. So you officially moved from yeah. bass to drums. Yeah. Uh, with Reliant, was there anything that was really important or cool that you learned? A lot of things. I mean, Reliant being, it was a very screwed up company. So I learned what bad companies look like and oh. shady companies look like mm. to some degree. Are they still in business? Are we going to get sued? No, they got bought by someone else. Um, it wasn't super shady, but, you know, there's nothing illegal. It was just the marketing sleaziness, I guess, of, of some things. Just being being at that level and seeing being in those meetings and seeing how discussions about that kind of stuff happen and, and stuff was eye-opening. It wasn't all, you know, technology and cool, cool, cool. Here's this new device we're making. You know, there was real stuff happening and real customers and patients who weren't the customers. The doctors were the customers, but the patients you had to look out for first because they're the ones that your device is being used on. And I'm using two strong words with, with stuff like sleazy and stuff, but, um, you know, it's, you see the market you're in and, you know, dermatology, even though we were treating things that were, um, helpful for a lot of people, it was still, you know, what you think of the kinds of doctors who are buying stuff. And there's a lot of LA doctors and things, and they have certain, <laughs> uh, they had certain ways of, uh, of wanting things and they weren't necessarily compatible with the way we wanted to make the devices too. So. But in the networking, you weren't involved much with marketing. No. And even if you were, the people you were marketing to were very, very technical. Extremely technical. And so this was a very different yeah. Yeah. application yeah. Yeah, customer base. Yeah. Yeah. Um and there were, you know, the the company culture was not great. Uh it was very it was very sexist. Um things that bothered me a lot there. And uh that was a surprise coming from Cisco and Procket, which were definitely not that way, or at least not not where I saw um, or even was able to see at that time. Um, so I had visibility into stuff that I didn't particularly care for. And while I learned a lot and while I had a lot of control over technology, I didn't have a lot of control over those other things. Um, so the, the learning experience was, yeah, I learned a lot about Embedded and very quickly and how to make large scale device software from the ground up uh, and FDA stuff. But uh, I also learned ah, not all places are necessarily well, <laughs> well run with good cultures. It, it showed you what 
a company culture really can do yeah. Or yeah. for a company. Yeah. So you left there. Yeah. And you went back to Cisco. I did. Why? And how was it different? I have no idea what I was thinking. I, part, I think I really wanted to get the hell out of there. So that was, that was part of my thinking. Um, Cisco You've been came, there for about three years. Reliant. Mm, um, 2004 to 2007, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, yeah, 2004 to 2007. Yeah, so Cisco, I think I interviewed at some other places. No. No, I didn't. When did I interview at Apple? I don't remember. After Cisco. After Cisco, After okay. After this Cisco. So I went to Cisco because some folks at Procket had ended up there. Procket had bought Cisco. Nope. 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 Cisco had brought Procket <laughs> <laughs> for a very small fee, um, basically for the employees and a little bit of the IP. And some of those employees stayed there. And after several years had kind of revived the Procket chip architecture within Cisco, they were going to redo it and have it be the basis of some new Cisco switches and things. And Cisco had already taken Procket software and made it the basis of uh, a new OS. So that was kind of cool. Um, so they were doing the chip thing, and I'd been talking to some friends on that team and wanted to get out of Reliant, and they were looking for some ex Procket people who knew, knew things. Uh, it sounded fun. So I, I interviewed there and ended up uh, heading over there. Did you enjoy it? Not at all. What happened? So the bellwether was I got there and they didn't have a computer for me for three or four weeks. Um, I had a desk and a stack of papers. What more do you need? More as a software <laughs> engineer. Uh, so that was, that was Omen 1. Omen 2 that I should have paid more attention to was they hired me into a different team. And I was seconded to the x Procket team. So I was supposed to only work on the x Procket stuff, but I was on a different team that was doing just normal, mundane uh, switch switch chip. There's a network processor in the switches, and they were doing normal driver stuff for that. So that's what that team did. The Procket team, the x Procket team, um, started out okay, but then they just went really slowly, and people stopped showing up. And uh, nothing was happening, and I'd end up going for breaks with the people, the other couple of people who came in every day, and you know, have a lot of coffee and talk about the impending financial crisis and long walks, British politics, and long walks, and uh, and the team I was on, the official team I was on, started wanting more from me, so I started working on very boring driver code, um, and then discovering that. Uh, Cisco's software development processes were a bit molasses-like. So anytime I wanted to make a one-line change, I had to go through 24 to 48 hours of static analysis. Builds took four or five hours. Uh, so by the time I got back static analysis saying it was okay to commit, the tree had already moved on. So I would probably have to start over. Uh, so I never, I don't think I actually successfully committed anything in the eight months I was there. Well, I don't need to ask you what made you leave, but you were still going to school at this time. And still working on your master's yeah. degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then... Close to finishing, but not quite. And then you did some consulting after that. No. I I interviewed with uh, Nuvation, which was a consulting house. And I got talking to somebody I'd worked with at Reliant about another medical device company. And ended up going to the medical device company. Sawtooth. Sawtooth Labs, yeah. Uh, what did they make? Uh, they made what's called an atherectomy device. Um, and ather from, ath from arteries, uh, atherosclerosis treatment device. Um, what it was was a catheter-based device that could go in somebody's leg arteries and it had an imager on it, so the doctor could see the inside of the artery to see what kind of disease was present. Uh, and then combined with the mechanical part of the catheter, the idea was you could see where disease and plaque was, and you could remove it. So that's um, an itty-bitty little camera. Not a camera. Optical fiber. Uh, so the 
Imaging sensor was optical fiber based. I uh, used a technology called optical coherence tomography, which is sort of an interferometry technique. Um, and you shine a laser into the tissue and some of it reflects back. That interferes with the light at the end of the fiber. And you, some of it comes back all the way down the fiber and you get it on a photo detector. And then by manipulating the laser in certain ways, that ends up being the Fourier transform of a scan, a single one-dimensional scan into the, the tissue you're looking at. So you inverse Fourier transform that and you get this intensity profile. And so you scan the the fiber around, and then you build up, kind of like ultrasound, an image, a complete image out of these one-dimensional sort of slices. So yeah, we did that. That was um, so that was super fun. I got to use my physics background because I had to read a lot of papers about the optics and how to do the image processing, um, how to clean up noise and stuff. And there's a lot of high-speed data acquisition, really high speed, because we wanted eventually we wanted like 30, 40 frames per second of a whole rotated slice. Um, and if you think about how fast you have to be doing things to get high resolution and spin that fast, um, it's quite a lot. So that was fun until it wasn't. Well, how big was the company when you started? Just a few people, maybe five or six. And the CEO, the funder, Mm -hmm. the founder, founder, wasn't, and funder, (laughs) wasn't involved for the first bit. Yeah, I think for like the first six months, he wasn't, I never met him, didn't really talk to him much. I think he called into a couple of meetings, but that was it. And then things started to change. Yeah. So he took on an active role. Company's focus got a little defocused. Uh, they weren't sure what they wanted to make. Um, he didn't like the answer that whatever we made was going to take at least two years especially with regulatory involved. Uh, So we kind of floundered and did a lot of lab stuff and experiments for years, um, which was fine. You know, wrote some good software. Um, It was a good learning experience again. And, uh, you know, I got to hire somebody who I really liked. A couple people. No, just one. Uh, Did I hire? I can't remember who hired the second person. It might have been been Dennis, but... um, hired Dennis, who was great to work with. And so that, that kept me going for a long time. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a slog. And then, you know, it, it was definitely a startup, intense startup environment again. And I, I got really burned out again. And uh, my mental state was very poor. <laughs> um, How did that, I mean, what did that look like? Uh, well, what do you mean? What did it look like? Like, how did I feel? Yeah. Or like, how did that come out in your life? A lot of physical kind of distress. Like my stomach didn't do well. Uh, I had a lot of problems in my stomach, had a lot of problems sleeping. Um, you know, your general anxiety and stress, physical symptoms. Uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't feel great. But before all that, you did get to see the device work. How, yeah, how yeah. is how is the OCT catheter different than just a normal catheter? I mean, it's got this imaging, but how do they usually do cleaning out plaques from arteries? Um, it was rarer. These devices existed before imaging, um, but it's super hard to do without good imaging because you might take something you don't want out of the artery. Seems bad. Um, but, you know, they do similar things with x-ray or ultrasound. There was an ultrasound that, that could go in in the arteries as well, but the resolution was quite a bit lower than the, than the optical-based system. Um, but, yeah, usually x-ray guidance and stuff. But, uh, yeah, for the disease it was targeted at peripheral artery disease, which is something that happens to a lot of older people, especially with diabetes, um, your, your leg arteries get plaques in them and your circulation gets really bad. And a lot of times they have to do kind of pretty invasive bad stuff to resolve that up to, you know, amputation and stuff. Um, so this was like, okay, if we can go clean that out, we don't have to, we can save people's legs. Um, so that was the main goal to start with. And I, I, we did that. I mean, the product worked and did save a lot of people's legs. And they, they wanted to go on to cardiac stuff after that, 
which was a much bigger challenge. Um, but if it, if it worked for that, that would be a huge game changer and, you know, replace open heart surgery in some cases. Um, I don't know if they, they still exist to some degree. I don't know if they've gotten there. But... And around this time, you also finished your degree. Yeah. <laughs> so there was some additional stress maybe floating around. Um, I seem to recall one question uh, that was important in your degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many electrons are in a chicken? I don't remember. It's a lot. Especially if you start out with a 10, 10 kilogram chicken. <laughs> so I decided not to do a thesis because I wasn't enjoying research and I went back to work and the thesis is a different kind of work. So uh, to finish my master's degree, I did an oral exam instead. And so you had to get a bunch of physics professors in a room and they just pepper you with questions while you're at the white blackboard and for a couple hours. It was pretty intense. Uh, but the first question was, how many electrons are in a chicken? And I, being a good physicist, I, I uh, you know, approximated things to nice round numbers so I didn't have to do a lot of arithmetic. And I started with a 10 kilogram chicken and they thought that was a little large. I mean, you've been a vegetarian for a long time and not, not a cook before <laughs> then, but 10 kilograms is a lot. It turns out I, I use the metric system exclusively in my physics courses, but I never really got a, a working sense <laughs> for, for what a kilogram was or, you know, con <laughs> compared to pounds. You just, these are just numbers. Who cares, right? So 10 kilograms, is, what's that? It can't be more than 10 pounds. <laughs> so as things with Sawtooth, now Avenger, <laughs> yeah. um, became more startup and, and you, you decided to leave. How did that work? I basically said, I'm either leaving or you're converting me to a contractor. Because uh, I thought that if I switched to a contractor, I'd be less emotionally invested, less mad all the time. I wouldn't have to be there at the hours they demanded. Uh, I could work fewer hours. I would feel less guilty about taking off if I wasn't feeling well. And uh, they said, yeah, let's do the contract thing. And I did that for a while. And did it work? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, and still so you, mad, but I wasn't mad, mad. <laughs> you weren't as invested. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't feel bad about leaving. Right. And I passed it off, you know, I passed the team off to Dennis, who was much better than me at, at being a director of software. So that it all kind of worked out. And if you want to work for a Dennis now, you should contact Cruz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. You started consulting in general then, not... Yeah, I started taking on other clients. And you went back to it's Cisco. It's not going back to Cisco if they're a contract. If they're a contract. For the third time. <laughs> that's not going back if they're a contract. Uh, yeah. So another mentor who was at Cisco and had gone back there from, from Procket, and I think he bounced around a few other places first, but uh, was doing something cool and needed some help uh, doing a, a mobile implementation of a new, a new protocol. Not exactly a routing protocol, but... Uh, uh, sort of a, a means of putting a network on top of the network, an extra layer of indirection, which this is called LISP. LISP, Locator Identity Separation Protocol. And the idea was to kind of, you know, how everything has an IP address. It's kind of bad to have that be an identity of any kind. It doesn't really go, it goes with a device, not with, um, it doesn't even go with a device. It goes with a device, comma, the network you're on. Like if you have your cell phone, you get an IP address from Verizon, but when you're in your house, you get an IP address from your Wi-Fi network. But your phone is still your phone. And if somebody wanted to get to your phone, they can't just go to an IP address. So there has to be some out-of-band mechanism to figure out who you are. And there's lots of applications where that might be nice. Like, there's, here's this identifier for your phone, and it sticks with the phone. And that can be used like an IP address. Um, so that was this layer of indirection protocol that, uh, that he developed and Cisco was, was uh, working with too and um, needed a, a mobile application for demos. Like, okay, here's this working on a cell phone. Here we switch from Wi-Fi to cell and I'm still, I still have the same TCP session even though my IP address changed. So, Is that in use now? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know where exactly. Um, uh, it's definitely in use. It, it had a lot of data center applications turned out like you could for your vm you could give it one of these locators instead of an ip address 
And then if you moved it from blade to blade throughout the network, there wasn't a whole renumbering dance you had to do. How did you find consulting jobs? A lot of them found me. A lot of them were just prior clients. So like stayed consulting for Reliant, for or not Reliant, uh, Avenger. Sawtooth, Avenger. Sawtooth, which became Avenger. The OCT artery place. Uh, stayed consulting for them until 2016 or thereabouts. So for a long time. Um, and there were some other ones that were follow-ons to that, other companies doing OCT that needed help. And there were very few people who'd done the software for that. So that was kind of a, a niche thing I could do. Uh, but yeah, just network word of mouth. I didn't go seeking stuff. Have you ever gotten a job where you didn't already know somebody who worked there? Aside from the first Cisco internship? No, I have not. I have not gotten plenty of jobs where I didn't know. So I've applied to lots of places, but uh, I've never, never worked somewhere where I didn't know at least someone, I think. And that's, I mean, yeah. Interviewing is hard, especially if you don't know someone. <laughs> you worked as a consultant at Fitbit. Yeah. And then after, you switched after to full time. Pulled on uh, Fitbit as a client around 2012, something like that. Twenty, Yeah, 2013, 2011. Seems so long ago. <laughs> Damn long time ago. And then worked, worked. they became my primary client after a few years. Uh, and then many years after that, they they gave me an ultimatum and said, we'd like you to become full-time now. Not because we're without, going without, public. Yeah, we don't no, want to no, know. No, they were already, they weren't? No, they weren't public yet. I think that's why they were converting no, they everybody. they were public. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were right. public already. Well, cut this part. No, it's fine. <laughs> they were public already. Um, but um, as something happened with contractors and they decided they didn't want any anymore. And so it was unstated that if I didn't go full-time, they would terminate my contract. But it was an, a, you know, it was a nice, nice offer. And I said, I, as long as I can work remotely and nothing really changes, I don't, I don't care. Um, then that lasted a little while. <laughs> as my track record of full-time might have indicated to you after consulting there for five or six years or whatever it was, I did not last as long as a full-time employee. Uh, and you worked on Embedded, yeah, and then you worked on iOS there. Yes, and yes. you had worked on Android for previous clients, just for the uh, the Lisp Cisco stuff. Yeah, okay. And then you left. Cis you left. I'm sorry. I was going to say Cisco. <laughs> Who it knows? Seemed like it should go back to Cisco at any point now. <laughs> nope, not doing that. <laughs> um, but you left Fitbit. I left Fitbit. Last Why? Year. Uh, did. <laughs> Pick a reason. I had been working on iOS. The iOS team was not pleasant, was not learning things, was not contributing. Everything was an argument. Uh, the company was not doing that great. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd run out of my full-time, my, my acceptance of being a full-time employee. Well, one of the reasons you went was the people there were amazing. Yeah. And the I people mean, there were leaving. Yeah, a lot of people left. Um, the culture had changed a lot not for the better. Um, and so that was kind of disappointing. When I started there, it was a very diverse team. Um, great, great team. Best people overall that I've worked with. Just just everyone was really, really good. Um, a lot of diversity of experience, a lot of diversity of, of kinds of people. Um, it was just really nice. And then that just kind of slowly, slowly and not, then not so slowly kind of whittled away. And it became more normal, normal, boring, annoying company. What was the most important or interesting thing you learned at Fitbit? Boy, I don't have a good answer for that. IAR doesn't count? IAR sucks, yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I did a lot of stuff there, but it was it was weird stuff. I did graphics drivers and graphics and got pretty deep into graphics. layer and... Embedded graphics. I mean, I don't know if that's, I mean, that's kind of like saying got really deep into the Commodore 64. <laughs> it's not really applicable and except in a few places. It's not what most people think of when they think graphics. They think Halo 3, not trying desperately to draw a firework animation on a 
250 by 250 resolution LCD screen. <laughs> Just think anytime you get that firework animation. That's me. Christopher did that by hand. Yep. And are you still enjoying consulting? Yeah. No, it's nice to have gone back to consulting. Um, I'm getting to do another diverse set of things, which is great. Uh, I kind of gotten bored. Um, I'm doing iOS, which is really cool. Being able to do a whole app uh, by myself from the start, which at Fitbit, I was excited to go on the iOS team, but then it turned out it was like our team was like this little, we took a bunch of first firmware engineers and put them on an iOS team because we were supposed to be able to go back and forth better. And uh, we didn't get to do much. It was really hard to learn. And the, the app existed and was years old. So it's an existing code base. And it's always hard to make a contribution. Um, so that wasn't really fun. I didn't really, really felt, feel like I learned iOS very well, even after a year of doing it there. So, uh, yeah, I got a contract that I'm doing that now and felt like, oh, okay. I did learn some things at Fitbit. At least I know where to look for things, uh, and what some of these words mean. And so, uh, that's been fun and doing some ML stuff, different and fun. Yeah. And I like not working. I, I like just not being beholden to a company. Uh, instruments and music. Oh my God. So many instruments and music. So during the last two years of Fitbit, I bought 637 synthesizers. <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but pretty close. <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, at least one bass guitar, drums. Uh, yeah, yeah. And since leaving Fitbit, I've bought a good, a good I have a lot of instruments. <laughs> I, I, you bought me a guitar. No, you bought that before I left, didn't you? That was last year, May. I thought it, it was after you left. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. It was my birthday last year. So uh, you bought me an acoustic guitar, uh, an electric guitar a few, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. Eventually the whole house will just collapse in on itself the gravitational pull of all the musical instruments. I had to take a video today of, of some testing I was doing. I'm sorry. Were there instruments in your way? And they were totally, I was like, oh, don't mind the guitar. Sorry. No. And let's see, you do a podcast. I've never heard of it. Uh, oh, oh, why? I don't know. You asked me to. That's not true. Um, the dog asked me to. Nope. Try again. Um, it was all your idea. I didn't even know what a podcast was. We got a sponsorship from Nike for millions of dollars, and they pulled out at the last minute. We'd already recorded, so we decided to just do it anyway. Is that the story? No. No. I think I said, hey, why don't we try podcasting? Because you wanted to do something. I'd had a bad class. Yeah, I was yeah, doing yeah. community classes, and it was the teacher was bad. And I was like, I'm not doing this again, but I need to learn something. I said, let's said, do six or so episodes, 350 something episodes ago. Uh, you didn't ask me what music I'm playing. What kind of music are you playing? Uh, I play in a band called 12, I'm going to do selfless, selfless. This is a very selfless self-promotion. No, shameless self-promotion. That's the word, not selfless. That's, that's different. That's totally different. Uh, shameless self-promotion. I'm in a band with my brother again. Uh, it's just the two of us and we make, uh, kind of weird art rock, hard rock instrumental music. And the band is called 12 AX7 named after the tube. And, uh, we have a record we're finishing up and we have several songs out there on iTunes and all the other places from that record, but the whole record isn't there yet. Yeah. And we do that remotely. So we ship stuff back and forth over the internet and, Mix stuff together over Zoom, of course, now, because that's all you can do. What do you wish I'd asked you about? Um, I don't know. This is take two. So is there anything you asked me last time that you didn't ask me this time? Not much. Um, although I guess that's what, why this is take two. Yeah. Well, it turns out, uh, and uh, I, what happened was... <laughs> You see, computers. We hate them. When you use a computer, it expects you to do certain things. 
every time. And if you do not do those things every time, different things happen. Sometimes the different things are good. Usually the different things are bad. And in this case, the different thing was that I recorded the entire podcast through the tiny internal microphone of my MacBook Pro, which almost kind of sort of could have worked, except Alicia is not facing the MacBook Pro and she's about eight feet away. And so it was mostly me talking to a ghost voice with a lot of echoes. And it, uh, yeah, we, we, we binned it. I suggested releasing it as a Patreon goodie that was just weird, but uh, he binned it. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, you know, I think I, I had a, a glib thought last time we did this podcast, but this time I actually thought about something. Everyone's relationship with work is different. And it took me a long time to figure out what I was comfortable giving to a company and to the concept of work. Uh, and I'm very lucky to be able to kind of find a relationship with work that is acceptable to the way my brain works and uh, and my feelings about things. So I don't know if I have advice exactly, but don't feel bad if you don't feel like the company environment necessarily fits you. There's other things you can do. It may be hard to do them. It may not be successful. Uh, but uh, there's other ways to engage with tech work that isn't the standard path. Our guest has been Christopher White, my partner here at Logical Elegance and co-host of this very podcast, Embedded. He's also my sweetie. Thank you to Christopher for producing and being a guest, and thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. I do want to point out that we never said OSPF actually stands for Open Shortest Path First. There'll be a few links in the show notes if you want to know more about those acronyms. And now I don't have a quote to leave you with. I'm going to leave this spot open so Christopher can put some music in. You think I'm going to put music in? I have an hour to edit this. Oh, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, Fine, I'll put a 12x7 song. Do you, do you want no, to? Or, or I can just use the OSPF thing as a... No, I'm leaving this, the whole this meta discussion, and, I, and I'll put a 12x7 song. Okay. This is hot off the press. Yeah. We're, we're releasing this in an hour. Wait till last minute, it only takes a minute. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.